Okay, in part two of this week's content, I want to just touch upon um, an, another way of thinking about how the body is implicated in consumer culture uh, by particularly focusing on some board, uh, ideas from Bourdieu to think about how taste and class, morals and values are implicated in the way that we think and feel um, when we're uh, participating in consumer culture. So um, Bourdieu's well-known work, Distinction, discusses some of this at length. Um, taste, a class structure turned into nature, is embodied. It helps to shape the very class body. So here, you know, everything the body ingests, whether material in terms of, you know, food um, or doing exercise or, you know, or, um, taste in terms of films and music and books and all that kind of stuff. Bourdieu's argument is this that reflects the kind of class structure. Um, and this has implications on body shapes, um, and the, this, this, the argument here is that the body, therefore, is as much socially produced as biologically produced. That our different backgrounds, our different class cultures um, mean that we consume in different ways and this will have effects on how our, our bodies end up. Now, again here, there's no fast determined sociological rule to say that, for instance, um, you know, people from disadvantaged backgrounds might... Uh, have higher rates of obesity or whatever, although that, that seems to be the case in some time, in, in many ways. So it's important here to think about these as homologies, um, you know, statistically probable, um, and, and it bears out in some of the qualitative research as well. Important here, remember though, is that when I was discussing Borgia last week, or the, the previous weeks, um, the notion of reflexivity challenges some of these ideas and the body itself today is something that's increasingly seen as something that can be reflexively shaped. Um, but the Borgesian analysis of this kind of would highlight how these things are inflected by um, class and gender and um, ethnicity inequalities as well. Now having access to a gym, you know, itself is relatively expensive. So the body in this sense becomes a form of capital, the way that it develops, the way that you have... Um, particular kind of holding yourself, your body language and all that kind of stuff is socially produced from this Borgesian perspective. So, you know, it's quite expensive to, to get healthy, to be healthy, to eat healthy in particular. Um, Bourdieu's work found that middle class, sorry, so the working class meals tended to focus on quantity and middle class meals tend to, you know, focus on, you know, the notions of quality and authenticity and and stuff like that. Now again, some of the work around this points out that what this kind of relates to as much is the physical nature of work, that um, working class um, tend to be working with the body more than the, the mind and therefore kind of need more sustenance in that sense, more energy. Um, and middle class meals, you know, tend to then um, be used to kind of as a much of a, a way of distinction and status. Um, it's important to remember here, though, that these things change quickly over time um, and what, you know, may be seen as healthy at one time, may be unhealthy now and, and vice versa. Um, and particularly is the likes of, you know, MasterChef and, you know, whole channels of cooking um, are on TV more and more that maybe um, some of the values around food are changing and maybe, you know, it might, it's becoming more normal for, for working class diets to be, you know, more healthy or more focusing on you know various forms of authenticity or whatever. Um, I've, I've got a link there to a way of thinking about this too. You're probably again familiar with this is the the um, McBody idea that um, the Super Size Me documentary looks at and talks about you know itself about how fast food and the the dominance of it in our culture has all kinds of um, um, health implications. So um, if you if you haven't seen that, it's well worth checking out. It's uh, a good fun documentary about the book. So the Borgesian notion of food, I think, is well expressed by the quote here that I've, I've put in from Daniel Miller. Um, the taste of working class people is for food that evidently fills you up when you are hungry, like roast beef, potatoes, fish and chips. This reflects the fact that they maybe make a living through manual labour. The wealthy, meanwhile, are divided into those with financial capital, who naturally like their rich sauces and truffles, as against those with cultural capital, who prefer nouvelle cuisine and minimal food that, in direct opposite, opposition to the situation of the working class, seem to deny that we actually eat food because we need it. The middle class have their own moral capital, reflected in the taste for organics and for fair trade. The point is that each group disdains the other as vulgar or pretentious or whatever. So taste is really a map of structural differences between classes. 
Now, it's important there to kind of acknowledge that those structural differences are blurry, um, that they're not hard, again, hard and fast rules. But I think that kind of quote nicely um, illustrates the, the kind of spirit of the Borgesian analysis of food, that it's often used as a way of um, forming distinction and status groups between um, different uh, groups in society. And therefore, the experience of food and the pleasure of it is heavily bound up with those class tastes. So importantly here, when we're talking about pleasure and sensation, um, that our enjoyment of food um, from this perspective is produced through that hierarchy. So here it's really important to think of taste, and here I'm talking about the physical sensation of taste, again, is something that is seen to be socially constructed and is not innately biological. That... Um, you know, that it's largely connected to morals and values around taste cultures. And that, you know, if we could think differently here about ourselves, we would easily like different foods if we were brought up in a different culture. Um, and I think, you know, the, I, I, I talk about this at the end of today's lecture, the kind of cultural differences of food, the way that we kind of, you know, feel, you know, disgust for those that eat dogs, whereas other cultures feel disgust of our cultures that eat cows, um, shows how these kind of, Taste hierarchies are rather arbitrary and they're heavily embedded with cultural norms. Now, one way of thinking further through the notion um, of Bourdieu's distinction and the very kind of um, the effect and sensation of enjoying food is through the notion of gastrophysics, which has been popularised by the likes of Heston and other, other famous chefs. If you're interested in this book, in this uh, um, in this in these ideas, uh, Charles Spence and um, co-workers book The Perfect Meal is kind of the, the place to start. Um, so they, these people have their own research centre where they were um, really heavily in, interested in the kind of psychological um, ways that food is enjoyed and not enjoys and the way that our senses is really heavily inflected by our moods and by the architecture of space that you're consuming the food in. And so they've, they've done all kind of really interesting experiments. Um, they show that, you know, um, through their work that people don't think food tastes as good if it's arranged um, differently on a, on a plate. Like, so if it's arranged neatly and artistically, people experience the taste of it as better if it's more messily arranged. They've done experiments that show that if you give people a can of drink, if there's more yellow in the can, they will say that it tastes more citrus, even though the exact same drink in a, say, a black can, um, which really will taste the same, our experience of it is heavily influenced by the colour of the can itself. Um, here they see, show things like roundness on the product or the logo, for some reason tastes sweeter, while pointy is more bitter. Um, if we pay more for wine, we think it's more delicious. Um, this, this is stuff that I find particularly interesting, interesting that if you serve food with heavy cutlery on heavy, on heavy plates, um, people perceive it as being of better quality, again, even if it's exactly the same product on lighter plates with lighter cutlery. So you can see here how our experience and our, our perception of the very taste of things is influenced by the kind of values of other parts of society. For some reason, we associate quality with heaviness, and this then um, has influence on our experience of the actual eating of, of the thing itself. There are other, other experiments where they, if they play classical music in a, in a space where people are eating, people be get, seem to be much more discerning in what they choose, um, and they'll tend to choose more expensive options. Um, while if they play loud music in, um, in a space, it tends to increase soft drink sales. This is another really interesting, uh, I think, example about the social embeddedness of enjoyment. Um, they find that whoever, in, whoever orders first in a kind of group situation or restaurant tends to be the one that enjoys their meal the most. Um, because what often happens then is that other people won't order the same thing, um, even though they may have wanted the thing that the person ordered first um, um, ordered. So they end up picking something else that they wouldn't normally choose and they therefore might not enjoy the meal as much. Again, you can see the way the social hierarchy here affects the way that we enjoy things or not. They've also done some lots of really interesting experiments with wine experts in particular, and can, they can actually trick wine experts by colouring um, colouring the wine different with red and, and white food dyes and stuff. Um, 
wine, also, wine seems to taste 50% sweeter when consumed under red light. So the reason I'm kind of pointing this out is to show that our, our, our tastes, and here I'm talking about our senses in terms of our taste, touch, smell, sound, um, that kind of stuff, sight, and um, actual physical sensation of taste, are heavily infected by our surroundings and by the social norms that we experience that stuff in. So it's important to remember that this kind of you know, values aren't happening. This experience and interactions aren't happening in some kind of social vacuum. Um, and what we seem to do is we bring our historical affinity with something, say, like classical music that we associate with high culture. And if that's playing in the background, we seem to somehow then perform ourselves as being more high culture and we'll order, you know, be more discerning and order more expensive stuff. It's the same thing here with the heaviness and qualities. For some reason, you know, heaviness of a plate has been seen as being of higher quality. It relates to that kind of, um, you know, um, organic notion of the way that uh, craft will create, you know, pottery that's more heavy and, you know, we associate plastic with being cheap and, um, you know, less quality and that kind of thing. And so when that's served, when the food is served on that, it has a real influence. Um, the connotations of heaviness and quality have an influence over the way that we taste experience of things. So you can't really get the kind of an understanding of those sociological um, evaluations of the taste of foods without having a kind of sociological understanding of why, you know, you know, the heaviness of a plate is a, associated with quality and stuff like that.